All right. So yeah, again, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, thanks for watching. Um, today we'll be continuing our discussion of human enhancement. And so um, the reading for the week was a paper by Savalescu and Person, um, co-written paper on the issue of moral enhancement, which they'll take um, a pro enhancement side on. But what I wanna do this time is kind of set up the pro enhancement side before turning to the moral enhancement specifically. So you can see this is, um, this video or this lecture today is focusing um, on setting up uh, Julian Savalescu's work <clears throat> um, on the pro enhancement side, and then we'll get to the moral enhancement stuff uh, uh, in more detail next time. Okay, so before I begin um, with the presentation, sharing my screen as I um, customarily do, are there any questions or comments about anything that I could field? Okay. All right, so I'll go ahead and get started. Again, I hope everybody's doing great. Happy Tuesday night. Okay. okay. Don't need the Amazon page up yet. <clears throat> okay, we'll start here. I've got a lot up on my screen here. Um, okay, let's scoot this over. Okay, there we go. So the ethics of human enhancement, uh, Julian Savalescu. And again, we'll segue um, next time to his co-written paper and discuss um, the key themes from it. So if you haven't got to that paper yet, you've got, you've got some time if you wanted to start it before lecture, but of course you could always read it after. <clears throat> Okay, so I'll just do some stage setting. So this is uh, Julian Savalescu here. He's one of the key you know, transhumanists, as we've called them. So remember the Bostrom um, labels, um, the Roach labels, the Bostrom and Roach labels. Um, transhumanism is oftentimes taken to be the view that um, that um, the um, biotechnical or the biomedical technology that we have available for improving our lives in an enhancement sense is perfectly morally fine. Um, and even oblig obligatory required uh, in some instances. So sometimes a pro-enhancement side, besides being called the transhumanist side, is sometimes called the liberal eugenics side. Um, some try to steer away from the, um, the term eugenics when they describe their position. Um, Savalas, who doesn't shy too much away from that. Um, um, but others will. And the reason why some will try to avoid using eugenics to describe their projects is because eugenics um, is associated, um, isn't it, with some pretty um, evil experiments um, in human history, including in the 20th century eugenics programs that the Nazis um, would run um, in the concentration camps. Um, but that didn't happen just in Nazi Germany, it happened in other parts of the world, including the United States in various ways. So eugenics has a really, a really a bad rap. Um, if you just look at the term though, I'll, I'll do a quick, quick pause on this. Look at the term eugenics. So the, the eugenics part clearly is related to, right? The term we have for genes, right? So, and then the U is related to um, a word that we get from the ancient Greek language, which means good, or happy or well. So eugenics put together would be like, what it mean nowadays would mean something like, if we're thinking about it literally, without all the sort of baggage, the negative baggage um, that has resulted from history, we mean good genes. Okay. With a good expression of genes or some such. Okay. So here's Savalescu. Um, when we get to the, the Savalescu in person piece, you'll see what person looks like. Um, there he is again. He's an Australian philosopher, born in 63, and um, uh, still currently alive and, and active, very active doing philosophy. He's at the um, University of Oxford. He runs um, one of the most uh, prestigious bioethics centers in the entire world, the Uhero Bioethics Center, which has many, many distinguished philosophers who work in ethics and, and bioethics. So he is the director. And I should note, maybe some of you have heard of the philosopher Peter Singer. Um, Savalescu is a protege of Peter Singer. So Peter Singer, he is 
an Australian philosopher as well, who also teaches here in the United States. So Peter Singer has joint appointments, teaches um, in Australia, but also at Princeton University here in the States. Sort of splits time between the two, but um, Peter Singer for the longest time was probably the most controversial uh, philosophers in the area really of, of, of ethics and applied ethics. That's typically where you're gonna find more, um, you know, um, or there's gonna be more room for some controversy um, um, when you think about philosophers. So here's Peter Singer. This is um, an image you can find readily online, but it's also on the cover of um, one of his most famous books called Practical Ethics, if you're interested. So um, I think I've mentioned Peter Singer um, one or two other times in the course. Um, he, as I note here on the slide, he's a controversial philosopher. Um, he wrote a work called Animal Liberation in the 70s, which was significant to animal welfare, animal rights groups. Um, so he's, he, he's someone who has written on, a, on uh, a, a wide range of applied ethical topics um, from broad, a broadly utilitarian vantage point. So we should be familiar with what it means to be utilitarian. Um, remember the slogan or the, the slogan tag for utilitarianism would be something like promote the happiness of all. Well, Singer's in that tradition. Um, and Singer's taken utilitarianism in many ways to its logical limits. And that's what's led to him being controversial. Controversial in that he takes animal interests very seriously. Um, some think that he takes animal interests too seriously. Not only has he been uh, a philosopher defending you know, animal welfare, he's also been someone who's gone out and actually went out in his boots to try to advocate for animals, have himself arrested. And um, in the 2000s, uh, I wanna say the middle 2000s, middle late 2000s, and perhaps a bit thereafter, Singer actually ventured um, over here in the United States to work undercover at various um, um, uh, factory farms so there were those you know, who like to push back against the empirical data that suggests that factory farms um, are inhumane places for animals. Um, Singer wanted to try to figure out what empirically is true about factory farms. So he and um, a colleague of his who co-wrote a, co a book called The Ethics of What We Eat, went to factory farms, got jobs in them, and um, saw firsthand what the factory farm conditions were like. And many of the you know, people who were employing him, um, the people he was working with, his coworkers, had no idea who he was. So he was either able to gather quite a bit of evidence about how the conditions of factory farms are quite uh, inhumane. So if you're interested, The Ethics of What We Eat is the book there. But as you can imagine, this kind of advocacy, this kind of going out and about and doing the empirical work and then presenting it um, um, in published work uh, led to um, quite a bit of hate mail and controversy. Um, he also, though, um, uh, added to his being controversial by um, arguing for claims on utilitarian grounds in his career that, um, that infanticide is permissible. So um, infanticide obviously is the view that, um, or obviously the phenomenon of, um, of killing babies, killing infants. And Peter Singer um, argued that, um, that given that um, abortion is permissible and he wanted to give reasons why abortion would be, would be permissible in his works, um, it should also be the case that infanticide is permissible given that there's really no moral, moral difference between infants and, and fetuses. And he received quite a bit of hate mail for that death threats and the like while he was at uh, Princeton. He also has like you know, various arguments that, um, that suggest that if animals have a kind of um, ability to choose, which he thinks they may have like, you know, um, you know, some degree, at least some of the higher mammals, some, some of the higher animals, I should say, have some of the, have some capacities to, to, to make choices on the basis of having preferences and the like. A singer has made arguments according to which, like, it's not like absolutely ruled out that there'd be permissible sexual relations between humans and animals. And you can imagine that um, ruffled quite a few feathers um, in academia and where it was known um, in the public. So Singer, he's a very, that, I'm just trying to give you a sense of right, his controversialness. Um, um, Savalescu again is a, a protege of, of Peter Singer. So there's gonna be some overlap in views. Um, 
he has a uh, this is singer here. This is a you know picture of him in, you know, more recently. Um, so he has an um, he's also done quite a bit of work I should note uh, in the area of world poverty. So animals seem to be like a central focus for him in the first part of his career. Second part of his career, um, uh, he's focused quite a bit on world poverty issues, among other topics. But these are sort of central ones that he he um, became famous for, or infamous for. Um, his views in animal ethics were controversial. His views in the world poverty debate, perhaps um, even more controversial. So he runs this famous argument, um, Bob argument. I've got that just the basic idea sketched here on, on the slide. So since Bob is required to sacrifice his Bugatti, if you all know what a Bugatti is, if you don't look it up, uh, in order to save a child, we were required to sacrifice all our luxuries in order to save those who are absolutely impoverished. I don't expect you to understand that argument. No worries, I'll explain it. Let me see what's here in the chat. Maybe it's a question I can, I can field. Good, so um, no, I don't think it was one year, Alicia. Um, if I remember correctly, what Singer did is he kind of went back to some ancient practices and said that um, in some ancient Greek traditions, there was like an 18 day period um, in which um, 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 you know, families that, you know, or couples that brought a baby into the world or, or a female who brought an individual into the world would, um, They'd have 18 days to decide what to do with, with the infant. In some cases, what they would do um, when the infant was severely you know, disabled or had other major problems, they'd leave the baby to die, to, to die of exposure on hillsides and the like in just various locations where they basically dump babies. So Singer says that um, we could adopt something like that 18 day period where couples can bring a baby home and the baby's suffering and having um, a hard life in those first 18 days and things don't look very promising, then the couple can bring the baby back to the doctors and the doctors from there make the medical decisions um, necessary. So couples have that 18 day window. So it wasn't as like, you know, they have a year to decide if the baby's fully healthy and the like, they can go ahead and just have the baby killed. No, um, the position ends up being, you know, more refined in this kind of way where there's in this 18 day period um, the baby has to be suffering a great deal. The baby's then brought back to the medical professionals who then make a decision. So what's going to happen to um, uh, the child and things are done in a, in a um, the, the, the killing would be done in a kind of euthanizing way, right? Um, so think about the word euthanasia. We have that EU um, prefix, right? Which means happy, good, well, that kind of thing. And that Thanasia comes from, you know, thinking about the God, the, the Greek God of death, Thanatos, right? And so you put them together and it means something like happy death. Um, and so the idea would be the babies would be euthanized, um, at least according to, you know, Singer's proposal. I have another question. Sure. So like in the United States, they extended the like pregnancy termination to like, I think 36 weeks. Was he part of that? That's a good question. I don't know if he was. Um, I don't think he was, okay. um, but some may have appealed to his, um, some of his work, um, you know, in this area of, uh, as a form of justification, but. Okay, as far as I know, um, I don't know. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I just wanted to um, uh, give you a sense of what this world poverty argument is. Um, so the you could find this article on the article online that gives a really straightforward rundown of the argument in the Singer Solution to World Poverty. If you're interested, um, and if you're interested, I've actually written a response to to Singer on that. If you're again only if you're interested and wanted to know, there's a pretty short reply that I have. Um, so, um, that was just a, a quick little, um, uh, uh, effort to promote my paper. No, uh, it's a minor piece in the literature. So, um, so here's, here's the Bob case. So remember we're thinking about this, this world poverty argument it involves this character named Bob and having to sacrifice his Bugatti. I don't expect you to understand that a priori as we say in philosophy, um, or just through reasoning alone. So. 
Um, here's the relevant case that Singer um, develops. It's really a case developed by a philosopher named Peter Unger that Peter Singer develops in order to run his, uh, his solution to uh, world poverty. So here we have, um, this is the Bob case, we'll call it. And we have Bob right here. There's Bob. And Bob is of retirement age. So he's um, quite a bit, he has quite a bit of savings and he's, um, he's about to retire. He takes his retirement money and he invested in a Bugatti, a very, very, you know, awesome Bugatti, very awesome, very expensive car, um, which I have just very, very simple crude um, Flintstones like representation here on the slide um, of. And so um, um, Bob, he's kind of done all the relevant calculating. He realizes, gosh, if I purchased the Bugatti with my savings, given that the market for Bugattis is going up, if I just enjoy the Bugatti for a little while, I'll be able to sell it and make a, make a, make a serious profit off of it. So he decides to do that. Um, he buys the Bugatti and it turns out that he lets the insurance lapse. So he doesn't have insurance on the Bugatti for a, a while. So he takes it for a ride as you'd expect him to do. He loves his car so much and spends a lot of time driving it. He goes on a drive and he needs to take a break. And so he stops, um, gets out, stretches his legs, you know, uses a restroom or whatever. And um, on his way back, to the Bugatti, he realizes that he parked his Bugatti um, on the side of a trolley track or a rail railway track. So you can see where this is going. This is basically gonna be a glorified trolley case. And so um, as he's on his way back, he, he notices again that, the, that, the, that his car is parked right next to this trolley track. And he sees this child eventually who's, who's playing on the tracks. You know, the, the child's really um, just in her own head, you know, playing. So, you know, Bob tried hollering in the direction of the child, but the child can't hear what's going on uh, for whatever reason. And then um, what he then notices is that there's a really, really fast approaching uh, runaway trolley, RT, that is making its way toward the child. And it's a runaway trolley um, because nobody is in it. There's no person um, operating it. So we have this runaway trolley that is about to smash into the child. The child um, isn't gonna be able to get out of the way in time. No worries, um, there's a switch right here. Bob uh, has quick access to, it's very reliable, right? I've even labeled the switch here. So what Bob needs to do right now is he needs to, it seems, flip the switch if he's going to save the uh, child that's on the tracks. And so he has to make a decision. Right, because if he flips the switch right now, and that's what he would have to do if he's gonna save the child on the tracks, then what's gonna happen is, is the trolley is going to veer off to the right and smash into the Bugatti, destroying his, right, his Bugatti that is not insured. So basically this life savings investment that he dumped into the Bugatti is going to disappear, it's gonna vanish. And he sees all this happening, right? He, he's done all the processing in that split second, he has a decision to make and Singer claims, he stipulates, I should say, that what Bob um, does in the case, what he does in the case, quote unquote, is he, ref is he does not flip the switch. He refrains from flipping the switch because he wants to keep his Bugatti preserved and he allows the trolley to smash and kill the child. So in effect, Bob has killed the child, right? Or done that which led to the killing of the child or perhaps more accurately, he refrained from doing um, he refrained from saving the child, if I put it that way. Okay. Now, what Singer says is this. Once you, once you consider the stipulation that Bob um, uh, didn't flip the switch, but that he thought about it for a minute, for a second, split second, but didn't flip the switch, um, you think Bob's, um, Bob's um, inaction put it that way, his inaction is morally wrong, right? It's not, and it's not white lie kind of morally wrong. It's like seriously wrong, okay? And so Bob's behavior is going to count as, or his inaction um, more exactly is going to count as morally wrong, okay? But if his action counts as morally wrong because he didn't flip the switch, then doesn't it stand to reason that 
Bob was morally required to flip the switch? That seems pretty straightforward, doesn't it? Okay. So if, if you do wrong by refraining, then you do right by not refraining. That seems pretty straightforward. That's pretty common sense, pretty, pretty commonsensical. So Bob's required to flip the switch. He's morally required to flip the switch, but, but know what that entails. That entails that Bob is required to sacrifice his Bugatti to save the child. He's required to sacrifice his life savings in order to save the child. Okay, we might appeal to all kinds of things here. We might say, ah, look, um, when we consider the value of the child versus the Bugatti, it's a no brainer. The child has far more value than the Bugatti has. So just in terms of thinking about things in a flat footed, let's just think about the, the outcomes here, right? What's required is to sacrifice the Bugatti, the life savings in order to save the more valuable thing, the child, okay? So now going back, um, going back to the slide here. So remember, so since Bob is required to sacrifice his Bugatti in order to save a child, you get that part now. We are required, like those of us in like affluent societies, the developed world, those who have those of us who have luxuries, which is going to be the vast majority of us. But we're required to sacrifice all of our luxuries. So everything but our basic needs, everything but uh, what we need food wise, right, water or liquid wise, clothing wise, shelter wise, uh, basic medicine wise. I don't know, cell phone wise, I mean, it seems like cell phones and have become pretty um, required in, in our day and age. So there's room for you know, expanding the domain of basic needs, but you get the idea. Um, so, um, so since Bob is required to sacrifice really everything but his basic needs, his life savings, then we're required to sacrifice all our luxuries in order to save those who are absolutely impoverished because there's no moral difference between the two, you see? Because we could, we could think of, of ourselves just, just like Bob, right? We could, either, we could either save someone's life who's absolutely impoverished in some developing country, go to Sub-Saharan Africa, right? Southeast Asia. There are a lot of people who are in this condition. The numbers are trending down right, in the last, you know, 20 uh, years or so, which is a good thing, but there's still you know, something like 700 plus million right, human beings on the planet for whom death is imminent, okay, because they don't have their basic needs. And so um, we could choose to use our resources, the easiest thing to be thinking about would be, you know, fungible things like money to, um, to save people's lives, okay. So there's other things that we could Imagine, right? We could actually um, get off our duffs and go and help our help ourselves. But anyways, you get the idea, I think. So we could we could either have our luxuries and use our you know excess resources to right, enjoy our lives more, right? Or we can save a human's life. Okay. So we just weigh the values: luxuries versus human lives, luxuries versus human lives, luxuries versus human lives, all day long. And it looks like, um, the sooner we want to say, there's no moral difference in the cases. So we have to sacrifice everything, but, um, but what we need to survive in order to save those who are absolutely impoverished. And so that brings me to this, just find this final concept here, which I've already anticipated at what it means to be absolutely impoverished. So we talk about some, some um, a group being absolutely impoverished, right? That term absolutely is an important one. Um, it means that no matter what else is true in the circumstances, no matter what else is true about the state of poverty that the individual is in, they're going to be they're going to be considered impoverished. Um, so if someone's absolutely impoverished, we can put it this way. Perhaps this is the easiest way of understanding it. Someone's absolutely impoverished, right? Um, when they lack um, the, the resources to meet their basic needs. Okay. So they don't have the resources to get food, water, right, clothing, shelter basic medicine, et cetera. Okay. And of course, if you don't have your basic needs, then you suffer greatly and, um, and you eventually die, especially if we're talking about food, you know, drink, um, clothing, shelter. Okay. Basic, med basic medicine. Okay. 
So that's what it means to be absolutely impoverished. It has to be distinguished um, um, with being relatively impoverished. So the kind of poverty that we noticed here, that we notice here in the developed world um, is an important issue, um, but it's relative compared to these more absolute forms. Relative poverty is the kind of poverty that's, well, it's poverty, someone's impoverished, but where the individuals or the families aren't absolutely so impoverished. So once we define absolute um, poverty, we can define relative poverty in terms of it. So it's the kind of poverty right, that doesn't involve being absolutely impoverished. So one does have the resources to meet, um, to meet their basic needs um, when one is relatively um, impoverished. And that kind of poverty, right, expresses itself here in the US, like where, where we have like, you know, um, um, safety nets built in to um, uh, prevent people from, from dying, right? From lack of basic health care, lack of food, lack of water, lack of clothing. People do fall through the cracks and they do die, that does happen. Um, but it's far less likely to happen here than in um, the, develop, the developing uh, nations of the world, developing places of the world. Okay. So that's the infamous world poverty argument. And of course, what this ends up then implying, right, is that um, we need to, um, we need to be in a position where we're ready to give up um, everything but our basic needs to save those who are who are dying. And that's very that's very contentious as you can imagine, very controversial as you can imagine. Now keep in mind that Singer, he's well aware of the fact that if everyone were to give everything but their but their basic needs in order to save the absolutely impoverished, um, that there'd be a vast surplus right of resources going to <laughs> the apps. To, to those who are absolutely impoverished and really only a fraction, perhaps even a small fraction that would be needed to save the lives of the absolutely impoverished. So Singer claims that he has such a radical conclusion because very few people give enough to save those who are absolutely impoverished, right? But once a critical mass of people give enough, right, to save the absolutely impoverished, then the obligation would, would go down as it turns out. Because the facts of the world, right, matter for morality of what we're gonna, what we're, what we're gonna claim our moral obligations are, okay? So Singer's not gonna be committed to any kind of crazy doomsday scenario in which, right, nobody has anything. We're all kind of states, we're all living in states where we're just getting by with the basic, our basic needs. Right? That's not the claim that he's making, okay? It's just that given um, um, the state of the world is such that so few give, we need those who are giving and those who are inclined to give to give everything they can besides, right, what they need to survive. They themselves can't become absolutely. Um, they themselves don't have to become absolutely impoverished. Um, that might be a heroic thing for someone to do, just to sacrifice their life in that kind of way for other human beings. But um, Singer doesn't think that one's required for that. So Singer, he has some like you know softer um, expressions of his of his arguments here. Just in case you're interested, here it's an Amazon page. Um, the, this is the 10 year anniversary of his of his book, The Life You Can Save, where he gives practical steps. For, um, for just giving um, relatively small amounts of our income to and our resources to help those who are absolutely impoverished. So in this work, he lays out some of his arguments. He just doesn't push them to the degree that he develops them elsewhere because he doesn't want people to, to start giving. And if we can get more people giving, then it's as, it's as if the obligation spreads out and becomes much weaker uh, than it needs to be. Okay. In case you're curious, seeing is someone who does take this seriously himself. So last I heard, he was giving 60% of his of his resources. And he, he's pretty, you know, handsomely um, paid with his, you know, dual uh, professorships. So, and all the talks and all the rest, he's a public intellectual who makes good money just being a, an, just being an intellectual. So last I heard, he was giving quite a bit away. He feels guilty for things like having a second car and a, and a, uh, um, a home that he shares with others, a vacation home that he shares with others, a timeshare, I guess, is what he has. At least that's last I checked. Okay, that may interest some of you, but doesn't, uh, no big deal, just wanted to share um, that with you. So uh, keep in mind, Savalescu, he's following within, he's following in the, 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 the singer tradition. He has some controversial views. Okay, and um, this is just giving me an opportunity to develop, I think, 
you know, uh, a line of argument that many of my students, they take interest in and, and they take interest in at least in part because they want to try to find like what's wrong with his argument. And that's always cool when it get like these kinds of arguments get students thinking. Okay, so let's now let's, let's get back to the Savulescu and we're back to transhumanism. We're, we're back to the liberal eugenics program that Savulescu wants to develop. And Savulescu, um, he is, he's going to run three main arguments for his, his view. And we'll talk about those in turn. And then what he wants to do is develop some responses to some of the classic objections to um, the uh, uh, transhumanist view. Okay. Good, all right, so um, we'll call the first argument the bad parents argument. Um, good, so this is the bad parents argument. Um, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head the name of the article um, that I ordinarily teach with. So let me, let me, um, it'll come to me probably um, midway through this presentation, but um, it's a longer title. So that's why I'm blanking on it. So hey, Ted, I'll get the title uh, to you in case you're, in case you wanted to check out this paper. So it also what I call the bad parents argument. Um, so basic idea, in some cases, it would be wrong for parents not to enhance their children because not doing so is morally on a par with being neglectful parents, right? And or lazy parents, okay? And so in order to understand this line of reasoning, this sort of simple flat-footed way of understanding the bad parents argument, we need to define neglectful parents, lazy parents, and who we'll also call the non-enhancement parent, the parent that, um, the parent that doesn't enhance their children with the relevant uh, biomedical technology. Okay, with those goods that are available. Okay, so let's define neglectful parents. So neglectful parent is a parent who has a child. Um, the child is born with um, advanced cognitive abilities. Um, and so um, the medical professionals, they recognize this um, in the child. And so they say, look, okay. Um, and they go to the parent and they say, hey, look, your child has extremely advanced cognitive abilities. Um, or capacities, abilities. And um, um, there's, there's one catch though, it's that we've, we've noticed that, um, that, that those um, capacities and those abilities will diminish over time um, if the child isn't provided with supplement X, okay? With some supplement or other, that's easily accessible. You can get the local pharmacy, um, or the local, you know, drugstore, maybe over the counter in some way. There's just some supplement that the parent needs to give to the child. Okay, and by me, what I mean by um, um, the child's capacities and abilities diminishing cognitively, I mean to the point where the child would have ultimately just quote unquote normal um, cognitive capacities and abilities. Supposing we could define such things. Savalescu, he, he just setting up a case and supposing we can do such a thing. So um, that's neglectful parent. Neglectful parent is the parent who, as you can guess, fails to provide the um, supplement to, um, to his child. So this parent's called neglectful, obviously, for that reason. Neglects to provide the supplement. Okay, now... Um, but now there's lazy parent. Lazy parent has a child. The child is born with quote unquote normal or quote unquote average cognitive capacities, abilities, et cetera. The medical professionals recognize this, but they also recognize that there's a supplement available, widely available, easily accessible that the, um, the parent has access to, to provide the child with and if the child takes the supplement, then the, um, the child's cognitive capacities and abilities will increase. Increase how much you ask, increase to the levels had by the neglectful parent's child, right? Prior to that child's child being neglected, okay? So we just hold those levels fixed in that way. So this parent's just lazy, the other parent was neglectful. So we have neglectful parents and lazy parents. 
And of course, non-enhancement parent, we've already um, hinted at what the non-enhancement parent is. It's a parent that fails to provide the biomedical, technological enhancement goods to right, his or her child. Okay, so again, just the intuitive way of understanding the argument is that there's moral parity holding, right, between neglectful and or lazy parents and non-enhancement parents. And here's supposed to be the thought, neglectful parent, lazy parents, they do wrong. Their behavior is, or their inaction is uh, immoral. And so if they're, um, behavior, their inaction is immoral, and so is the behavior, uh, so is the inaction of the non-enhancement parent. So we've seen these moral parity type arguments over and over again, haven't we? This is a very common theme that we see in these applied ethics um, papers. Um, lots of philosophers like um, arguing that way because they begin with a really clear case and then they show, well, if this really clear case holds, then it holds in this case that wasn't so clear. And they just show there's there's a um, that there's moral parity holding between the very clear case and the case that wasn't clear initially, but hopefully now is. That's the best case scenario. So if we're to run the argument and just you know step by step form, it goes something like this. So the behavior of neglectful parent is wrong. Okay. Two, if the behavior of neglectful parent is wrong, then so is the behavior of lazy parent. The thought being that when we think about neglectful parent, we think about lazy parent. There's no moral difference between them. Okay, there are differences between them. The cases aren't identical. So make, make no mistake, the cases aren't identical um, in, terms of their, in terms of their detail, um, but they're identical in terms of their morality. Okay, so a neglectful parent right, has a child that has cognitive abilities, let's just say up here, right? If I'm just arbitrarily, you know, um, um, I state it this way, but then because the parent's neglectful, the child's, right? cognitive capacities um, decrease to this level. In the case of um, lazy parent, right, the child's born at this level when it comes to cognitive capacities and abilities, it could have been at this level where the relevant right, enhancement um, goods provided or the relevant supplement goods provided. The supplements can be understood as a kind of, as kinds of enhancement, of course, right? And so the idea would be there's no moral difference because it looks like we can, we can set things up just right so that the same amount of, as it were, you know, cognitive capacity or, or inabilities is, inability is, um, yeah, capacity, capacities and abilities are compromised. And one last little piece that's important is just that there does seem to be a tight connection between having advanced cognitive abilities, capacities, et cetera, and one's life going better. Okay, it's not you know necessary connection, but it's just generally one. Okay, and this is just in line with just you know common thinking that you know um, higher levels of intelligence you know correspond to typically better lives. Okay. Okay, so um, all that was um, just by way of trying to explain how we get to two, and then just by logic we get uh, three. So the behavior of lazy parent is wrong. So a way of thinking about this is that the behavior of neglectful parents being wrong implies that the behavior of lazy parent is wrong. But once we assume that the behavior of a neglectful parent is wrong, then we can right, trivially say that the behavior of lazy parent is wrong. Just drops down, just drops out, just by way of logic. Okay, and the four, here's the crucial step. Many people think that um, one to three is fine, but four, if the behavior of lazy parent is wrong, then so is the behavior of non-enhancement parent. So here we connect lazy parent to non-enhancement parent. So the non-enhancement parent is going to have a child that's going to be at this level, let's just say. And if the child were given the relevant enhancement goods, right, the biomedical technology or the biotechnical goods using Cass's expression, then the child's um, well-being levels would have right gone up to this, you know, this level, right, just arbitrarily right, um, providing these kind of, you know, um, vague uh, um, values. And then, um, but now think about the lazy parent. Remember the lazy parent has a child that's born with quote unquote normal average levels, 
of, of, of cognitive ability and capacity and brought and there to be brought up with a supplement to um, the, the higher level. So in both cases, we're, we're talking about the same thing, right? We're talking about going from quote unquote normal, quote unquote average to, right, to this higher level. Okay. So, so that's the strategy is to say, well, there's no moral difference between neglectful and lazy parent, but once you get to lazy parents behavior being wrong, then from there you go, well, then the behavior of non-enhancement parent is wrong as well. Okay. Because they're just going to be structurally more similar in that way. But you know, you can imagine someone running the argument in a more simplified way, right? Since the behavior of neglectful parent is wrong, then so is the behavior of non-enhancement parent. Okay. I mean, that's the one way that you know Savlovsky could have went, but he decided to just connect neglectful parent with lazy parent, because at least structurally the lazy parent is closer to um, the non-enhancement parent than to the neglectful parent. Okay, so that's the bad parents argument. The second argument is the argument from environmental enhancement. Let's see what we have here in the chat. Yeah, exactly. I mean, just assuming that supplement is risk-free, assuming that the enhancement is risk-free and, and the rest. So what Savales is going to do after running these arguments is he's going to go on to say, like, here's what a positive, like, liberal eugenics program would have to look like in order to get off the ground in the first place. And one of them is going to involve, right, those who are enhanced need to be kept safe. Yeah, so we'll get there. So good question. So, um, Savalescu then turns to uh, an argument that he has us consider using environmental enhancements to improve the lives of our children. Sometimes this is called the consistency argument. It's perfectly permissible to read our um, to read to our children, to give them quality education, or give, to give them a quality education, to sign them up for activities that improve their lives, right? So you know, sign them up for sports or uh, music music lessons or you know, craft, you know, shops, these kinds of things, right? Take them to the library. And again, yeah, read to them at night, um, get them into the best school you can, even if that involves having to move to a better school district, these kinds of things. Okay, so uh, we should help our children become cooperative, empathetic, and more intelligent. Okay, these are all things that we should be doing for our children and more, um, and, but, but if this is at least permissible and sometimes obligatory, um, that is to use environmental means to help our children be better lives, then the same holds for biological means. What could the moral difference be between providing our children with good education by manipulating our environment to do so and manipulating their genetics to contribute to the same, the very same goal, namely our children's lives going better and right? better for them. Okay, so there's, there's quite a bit that's built into this argument. Um, one thing that's crucial, one thing that Savalescu um, wants to cite here is empirical evidence to show that, <clears throat> that when we're thinking about, um, when we're thinking about the connection between the environments that we find ourselves in and our genetic expressions, that in fact, they are really, really closely related, that they are inextricably linked that our genes are always expressing themselves in some environment. And the environment, the broader, broadly speaking, the environment that we find ourselves living in right, impacts the expression of our genes. So um, this is um, called in the realm of biology, like the interactionist thesis or the epigenetic thesis. Um, it goes against very, very, um, um, uh, one-sided views that, that are out there that at one time or another in the last you know, 50, 60 years have held prominence. So views like our genes determine, right? Um, um, how, our, how our lives are gonna go for us or our, our, um, the expression of our genes more exactly um, is deterministic. So um, what do we mean to say that our our genetic expressions are deterministic would mean something like something like this like take any state uh, of our genes right or take the state of any genetic expression that we have at, at a time right um and then you take the the biological laws like that 
um, that influence the expression of genes, right? And you apply them to um, the state that we've uh, stipulated. Um, um, and, you, and you can join with that state that we stipulated and the genetic, the relevant genetic laws, the relevant biological laws, and you add the past, the future genetic expressions, right, are necessitated. There's but one way in which um, those genes can then express themselves. So the way of capturing this idea of genetic determinism is by thinking about the nature of the laws being such that, they're, that, they, that they themselves are deterministic. So the laws can join with the past will make it the case that there's but a single genetic future, right? Open to, right? Open to us, open to the, um, the beings like that have you know, um, genes in the first place, the, 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 the kinds of things that have genes in the first place, okay? That was a view that was held um, at various points in the 20th century, um, but it's since given way to the, um, to the uh, interactionist view, the view according to which the expression of our genes isn't deterministic uh, because there's also the environment that's playing a role in determining the expression of, of our genes. So it'd be the environment, the, the genetic laws, right? And perhaps other factors that determine um, the expression of genes. Then the other kind of um, one-sided view, or very very strong one-sided view, is is the is the environmental determinism view, according to which the environment determines the expression of our genes. Okay. If you're thinking nature nurture debate here, that's perfectly fine. Okay. Just note that um, the dominant view is, at least currently in biology, is that the nature and nurture, they work hand in hand with each other. I do think that there are many biologists who wanna say that, um, that the probabilities favor the genetics a bit over the environment. I think some say as much as a 70, 30 kind of breakdown, genetics to environment, um, the probabilities and fixing the expressions of our genes. Okay, there is some debate on that as you can imagine. So, Here's the point, the upshot here is just this, given that this interactionist or epigenetic view is the correct one, then, um, then given that we're able to manipulate our environment in such a way that our genetic expressions are going to be also manipulated and express, be, uh, find different expression, um, it seems then that we could just um, intervene sort of directly, right? And maybe that is providing creating a kind of um, environment, but it needn't be, right? So if we can indirectly through our environment influence the expression of genes, why can't we just directly do so? That might be a way of thinking about, you know, Savalas who's up to you running this kind of argument. Okay. And I run just a, a just a step-by-step -step argument so you can see you can see it in case all these words were just kind of a bit much. So parents are morally permitted to enhance their children's lives using environmental intervention. So think, think education, think sports, think music lessons, think et cetera, et cetera. Or think even like, like nutrition, how significant that is. Um, and then two, if parents are morally permitted to enhance their children's lives using environmental intervention, then they're also morally permitted to enhance their children's lives using genetic intervention. So the, the reason why this, this is sometimes called the consistency argument is because we, we should be consistent, right? Environmental inter intervention is okay, so is genetic intervention. And then the conclusion, therefore parents are morally permitted to enhance their children's lives using genetic intervention. Okay. Right, so um, Savalescu, he does provide like empirical evidence um, here. Um, some of the evidence involves um, um, thinking about uh, um, um, mothered versus unmothered rats and the genetic changes that occur um, even down the line generationally after. Um, uh, so mothered rats tend to have more positive, right, um, genetic expressions. The unmothered tend to have less positive. And again, the less positive would continue generations after, right, the initial unmothering. And the same thing's true 
in the case of the mothering, where we, there's, we, where we have the positive um, uh, genetic expressions from mothering. So anyways, um, there's more um, information there, but that's um, at least to give you a taste. All right, good. Um, all right, so then the argument from the treatment of diseases. So the idea here is gonna be pretty simple, right? Um, we're morally permitted and or required to treat diseases so people's lives go better. If that's the case, then we could right, use um, you know, the moral enhancement technology to improve uh, people's lives, help their, those lives go better. So the goal of treating disease is to produce health, which in turn is to improve our lives, to improve our levels of well-being. Accordingly, the goal of treating diseases is to improve our lives. The goal of liberal eugenics is the same. The goal of you know, transhumanism, the goal of pro-enhancement is the same. One way of justifying an activity is by showing that it has a proper goal. There could be other ways of justifying an activity, but one prominent way is to just is to cite the proper goal. If the goal is a good one, then that these go some way toward justifying the, um, the action in question. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if the aim of enhancement is just as good as the goal of treating disease, then if we can easily justify treating disease, then we should also be able to justify genetic enhancement. I see this as kind of a consistency argument as well. I mean, if the last argument is consistency argument one, this might be consistency argument two. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, again, all three of the arguments seem to have this kind of built-in idea that there's moral parity holding, right, between the relevant cases, a very common strategy. And here's just the argument of premise conclusion form. So it's permissible or even morally obligatory to treat diseases. If it's permissible or even obligatory, uh, morally obligatory to treat diseases, then the same holds for using genetic enhancement, and the conclusion is going to follow, right? Again, the moral parity claim is going to be found in two. So it's permissible or even morally obligatory to use genetic enhancement. <coughs> Remember, the re the, what's going to establish the moral parity is right, the sameness of the good goal. Okay. Okay, so maybe what we could do is, um, before moving on to this bit, let's go back. First, let me, while I go back, are there any questions, comments, issues? Okay, so if you're wondering um, what some pushback might be um, <clears throat> with these arguments, well, <coughs> um, one, I think pushback has already been anticipated um, <clears throat> by Alicia. So um, in the case of neglectful and lazy parents, right? we're told that all the parents have to do, right, either to right, sustain the good that's gonna lead to, um, to well-being being enhanced, right, or um, to, um, to actually uh, um, raise the level, the, to, raise some, to raise the child to, to a certain level of um, cognitive ability that will likely result in um, higher levels of well-being is that they need to take a supplement. And of course, um, the supplement's gotta be safe. Right? Um, it's gotta be widely accessible or easily accessible. Something that even, you know, those who are economically disadvantaged, right? Those who might be considered relatively impoverished now that we have that um, concept in our terminology, that they'd have access to, right? Now, um, so even if we grant all that, um, that the relevant supplements would be that way, um, it's still a stretch per perhaps to think that, um, that our, our, um, our biomedical technology, right, that could lead to our being enhanced, right, in the relevant sense of, of enhancement, Right, getting the relevant biotechnical goods to use Cass's terminology last week. Right, um, um, 
like there's still like that's quite a um it's quite a promise isn't it to think that um uh to think that that technology can be as as simple as maybe taking a vitamin that's widely accessible um, if it is then the argument could go through but the pushback is a kind of practical one like maybe theoretically we go okay fine theoretically it's fine but 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 there's a practical pushback which is um, there's a promissory note that needs to be satisfied. And the promissory note is that we could get this, we can get the biotechnical goods to be as uninvasive as a vitamin. Okay. So granting or supposing that we can do that, we can get that kind of um, um, biotechnical genetic improvement from taking a vitamin in that way, then, then fine. But there's some pushback that's again, practical. Okay, will we ever be able to practically get to that level? Okay, there's a promise here, but we'll be able to get there. And so we won't be able to actually assess the bad parents argument for a long time, right? Presumably, unless the technology is, you know, very, very soon. It's in, it's, it's, it's going to come very soon. There's but there's no sign that's going to come um, very soon as far as we know. We know that, um, that some technologies are available, but they're not uninvasive, like taking a supplement. Okay. And evidence for this is that even Savalescu, when asked whether he um, would use um, the contemporary biotechnology to enhance his future children, you know, children he doesn't have it, could have with his, with his partner, he said, no, he wouldn't because the natural world is far better still with respect to um, these issues than we do um, using um, biomedical technology. Okay. <clears throat> now push back on the environment, the ar argument for environmental enhancement. Well, I thought here we'd go back to Cass. Remember him um, from last week, rich paper. Um, I thought I had the cast up. Uh, maybe I did. Um, oh yeah, there it is. It's just hidden under this. So there it is. So page 18 and 19. He doesn't go into much detail here, but this might give you something to hang on to um, in responding to the argument from uh, environmental enhancement. So he says this up on page 18, cast that is, although this is not the time and place to develop this point further, it is worth noting that attempts to alter our nature through biotechnology are different from both medicine and education or child rearing. I take this to be the environmental, one way of understanding the environmental point, one way that we could think about the environmental point. It seems to me that we can more or less distinguish the pursuit of bodily and psychic perfection, right? Ageless bodies and happiness of the soul, at least more of those things, from the regular practice of medicine. To do so, we need to see that it is not true, as some allege, that medicine is itself a form of the mastery of nature. When it functions to restore from deviation or deficiency some natural wholeness of the patient, medicine acts as a servant to aid nature's own powers of self-healing. It is also questionable to conflate child rearing. So this is, this is the environmental point. It's also questionable to conflate child rearing and education of the young with the attitude that seeks willful control over our own nature. So it's one thing to do your best to raise your children, provide them the right nutrition, educate them in various ways, either you know, through books, um, academic learning, or the learning that they would get from being involved in sports and playing instruments and et cetera, okay? Right? And to have this attitude that involves controlling our very nature by right, tinkering, to put it in that kind of way, with our, with our genes, with the expression of our genes, using, again, the biotechnical um, resources. So parents do indeed shape their children, right? 
They do. That can be granted for argument's sake. But usually with some tacit, with at least some, well, sorry, but usually with some at least tacit idea, most often informed by cultural teachings that have stood the test of time. Have the biomedical technologies stood the test of time? Will they? Maybe they will, but again, there's a promise here that hasn't been fulfilled. Right? If we're thinking about you know, a way we could respond to the second argument that Savlis develops by right? using a CAS-inspired objection, or at least pressure, CAS-inspired pressure. Right? So again, most often informed by cultural teachings that have stood the test of time. But what it takes to grow up, to live, in a, to live a decent, civilized, and independent life. The multiplicity of such cultural teaching should, of course, make us modest about the superior wisdom of our own way. But in any decent society, the rearing of children, that environmental component, would seem to be closer to teaching young birds to fly than, than, than to training an elephant to tap dance. But teaching young birds to fly seems to be in line with right, the nature of a bird. Right? But training an elephant to tap dance seems to count against the nature of the elephant. Okay, so there might be a bit of a hyperbole working at the end of that passage, perhaps for rhetorical effect. Okay, that's what I'm sensing at the end of that passage there, but still, I think the point right, is clear. All right, so that's just some pushback in case you wanted to um, think about that. Okay, and then the argument from the treatment of diseases, well, um, I don't have any lined up pushback for this one. Um, the pushback would likely involve challenging too, right? And maybe it's just not enough to cite the goals, right, of an action, to cite them as being the same in order to justify both actions, both kinds of actions. So. One kind of action is to treat diseases, another kind is to genetically enhance. And you say, well, both aim at the same thing, improving lives. Okay. Um, of course, treating diseases can improve lives by helping someone achieve, sustain, or restore health. Okay. Usually given tried and true uh, methods that have withstood the test of time and continue to withstand the test of time, at least to some degree or other. So then there might be sort of the same promissory note type response to this argument where perhaps it'll be the case that the genetic enhancement of goods, right, will stand the test of time, will last the test of time. But it's a promise that we need to, we would need to see like fulfilled not something that we can assume is true today. Okay. Okay, so the last uh, few minutes here, um, let's just um, maybe flesh out the, um, the conditions that Savalescu thinks need to be in place for a human enhancement program. And that'll be enough for, for this time. So, um, I mean, let's, let's, well, I guess we still have um, maybe enough time to get into some of the um, objections. We'll see. We'll see how this goes. So, um, so here we go. There's um, um, the condition I've already emphasized, the fact that whatever is true of the, um, the human enhancement goods, they've got to be safe. The technology has to be such that when we distribute um, when we distribute it, we distribute the forms of technology, right, that they're safe for those who would be consuming them. That seems to be a no-brainer. And relatedly, when we're enhancing, we, can, we should just abide by, at least generally, this very simple principle of no harm, okay? Um, we should avoid using the technology for harmful purposes. Sometimes it's, that's put in the following way. Sometimes we, you know, we, we should avoid um, um, acting maleficently. So if we think about the contrast concept of acting beneficent, which, is, um, which involves you know, doing good for others, um, maleficence is the contrast concept, which means doing harmful things to others. We should avoid being maleficent. 
to those who are going to be enhanced, whether they be our children, whether they be ourselves, or whether um, they be others. Moreover, according to Savalescu, we can't get an enhancement program or liberal eugenics program to use his terminology, at least in places off the ground until there's a fair distribution of the enhancement goods available. So, so that way there's um, equal access to uh, the enhancement goods. This is consistent with some deciding not to opt for the enhancement goods. At the very least, it's got to be available in a widespread kind of way, in a fair kind of way. So there are issues related to what we call distributive justice. When you about distributive justice, be thinking about the principles of justice associated with right, the resources and their distribution in a society, in a community, et cetera. Now, you might be thinking that, at least initially, flat-footedly, that what this, what this condition would, would mean is that everybody gets the same amount of enhancement goods. There's equality with respect to, like perfect equality with respect to the, um, with respect to the distribution of the enhancement goods. But that needn't be the case, right? Because um, um, it might be the case that, that principles of distributive justice, principles of the fair distribution of goods generally don't require exact equality with respect to their distribution. It just requires that the distribution be, as it were, equal enough, okay? I mean, think about how we allow currently quite a bit of inequality, okay? Now, we might, we might even, you think, allow too much inequality, right? That's certainly an argument that's being made like left and right um, uh, these days. Um, so we might think that there's quite a bit of inequality too much inequality, right? But um, you might think that that's consistent with still allowing some inequality with respect to the distribution of goods, right? Just because some people might deserve more, some people might be able to, um, 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 through their excellence in, in creating resources, right? They might be allowed to gain more so as to create, as it were, more equality in the long run or less inequality in the long run as the case may be. So think about like those who, you know, like maybe the Bill Gates is, if, if that's an easy example that works, um, who are, they're so good at what they do that they're able to just create massive amounts of jobs, which then produce, you know, lots of resources, right? Lots of um, goods for those people who have the jobs and the like. So, so it might be the case that Principles of distributive justice won't involve um, a complete sort of um, uh, um, you know, equal distribution of the relevant uh, goods, in this case, the enhancement goods across the board, because it might be the case that some inequality is, is optimal right, in the distribution of goods in a, in a society. And there's debates to be had about these, as you can imagine. Moreover, the well being. Um, of the child needs to be promoted. If we're thinking about providing enhancement to, to children, to, you know, um, to the babies that are gonna be born who are gonna become children, okay? Um, think about Savalescu here. He's, he's spent quite a bit of time trying to justify human enhancement with these, with these three arguments that he gives us, right? Where well-being plays a central role. Right. Well-being seems to be morally relevant, and Savalescu locks in on it and runs three arguments where it's at its where it's at the core of all three of them. And this is in line with being a utilitarian. Utilitarians take well-being to be right central to morality. This is totally in line with the utilitarianism of Peter Singer, for example. Where Savalescu follows uh, suit, and then. Lastly, think about the conditions of human enhancement. When we use the enhancement um, on our children, we can't compromise their autonomy. Okay, can't compromise their autonomy. So we can't use, we can't provide an enhancement that's going to end up limiting, right, um, the range of options open to our children in the future, or that would um, uh, uh, create uh, an absence of control um, 
in the actions that our children would perform as they age, et cetera. So they're thinking about autonomy in two different ways. I hope you caught that. One way was having sort of options open, right? Having more than one option open, maybe more than two options open. Depends on the case, right? There could be there could be too many options, right? Where you're kind of stifled by the, there being so many options, you don't know what to do, right? Um, maybe you've all seen those commercials where there's the guy standing in front of the uh, frozen foods right at the store, and there's so many options, he's stifled, right? He's he, he, he's rendered, you know, paralytic. Um, and then the other notion that seems relevant to having, having autonomy beyond just um, you know having options, the right amount of options, et cetera, sufficient options would be controlling what's chosen, okay? So one may have a ton of options available to one, but then sort of arbitrarily find themselves just selecting one without controlling what they select. Maybe someone pushes one into the um, relevant foods in the food aisle and they pick that one dinner, whatever. Okay, so options, right amount of options and control seem to be relevant to autonomy. Okay, so I guess we can get into maybe one or two of these objections or implies to make some headway. Um, so some, some of you might be thinking, gosh, given those conditions for a liberal eugenics program, for a transhumanist program, if we put it that way, um, as I seem to me, but if, if we're gonna have such a program, it's far into the future. Maybe the, the distributive justice point is, is the point that's kind of a you know, sticking point. You think, gosh, like to be able to distribute those fairly, that's gonna take a long time. Okay. All right, so we have this um, cluster of objections that involve like playing God or going against nature. And we've seen this in the cast, haven't we? Cast wants to try to properly specify it, right? Relates it to the fact that when we play God, we're basically lacking humility and that's problematic. But um, So this objection has many uh, forms. So children are gifts. We lack the humility to think we can intervene in nature. Genes are pliotropic, meaning that um, um, genes are such that affecting one you know, genetic expression could affect other such expressions. And so quite a bit of empirical data right, would be needed to um, to avoid potential catastrophes um, as we try to enhance, you know, um, you know, um, ourselves with respect to some genetic enhancements. So we've got to make sure that we're not causing, you know, troubles in, uh, with the expressions of other uh, uh, genes. Nature provides us with, with proper genetic diversity. So these are all ways to understand the playing God or going against nature objection. Response. There are many ways we intervene in nature or already play God. So this is not a principled reason to rule out enhancement. People used to think that diseases were punishments from God, that pain is a curse from God on women for mankind's sin against God. We now treat and try to prevent diseases. We now give women pain medications during childbirth. Nature does a better job now than we could in providing for diversity. But with enough research, we could do we could do a better job than it with respect to the combined effort of providing for diversity, while at the same time improving the genetic results. So sometimes my environmental um, science majors will, you know, bring up the fact that quite a bit of diversity is needed for healthy ecosystems and the like. And when we get into this business of um, genetic enhancement, we start um, um, compromising potentially the diversity um, in the natural world. This could you know, end up leading to a kind of homogenization, the kind of homogenization that you know, Cass referenced um, last, in, in his paper that we talked about last week, right? And that's problematic. This is Masabalescu's reply. Look, we gotta, we gotta do the empirical work and perhaps we can um, do better with respect to um, ensuring a kind of diversity, right? While at the same time, improving our genetic condition right, across the board to improve lives. So um, crucial, um, the crucial, um, crucial to this res re response, excuse me, is that this isn't a principled enough uh, challenge because empirically we can continue improving, do science, keep, you know, keep doing good science and, um, and over time, we might end up doing better than nature with respect to this diversity point. 
And we were already, as it were, quote unquote, playing God by the way in which we you know, practice medicine, the way in which we improve our lives, through pain medications and the kinds of surgeries that we have that are less invasive, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, second kind of objection, genetic discrimination. So enhancement will lead to a society where some have the enhancement, uh, enhancements and others do not. Those who don't have the enhancements will be subject to discrimination. Okay. Uh, um, seems to be pretty, um, 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 a, an objection that's, you know, you know, currently one that we might understand quite well. Response, nature already predisposes us to, a, to an unequal genetic lottery as it pertains to those, uh, to those uh, of us who have the beneficial genes and those who do not. We can, we can work towards more genetic uh, equality, with enhancement, with, a, with irrelevant biotechnical goods using Cassis terminology and do so in accordance with the principles of distributive justice. Okay. So we can actually do better or try to do better than the natural lottery does in stamping out um, genetic discrimination, right? So that's um, the force of this response here. Okay. So of course, Savalescu has already said that when it comes to um, a genetic enhancement program, we have to have the relevant distributive justice principles in place so that we can fairly distribute these goods. That's again, consistent with some people deciding not to, um, not to go for the, the enhancements, not, uh, it's consistent with them not accepting um, the relevant um, widely available accessible goods, okay? But um, it, would still be, it would still be available. Um, now, um, at the same time, there's this sort of natural lottery component. Um, nature isn't fair in its allocation of, right, you might think of you know, genetic gifts or genetic healthiness and the like. And so um, a genetic enhancement program would actually help us, right, to, um, to offset, the, you might think, the cruel unfair, uh, uh, unfairness that we find uh, traditionally, historically, um, inherent in the, uh, the natural lottery. Okay. So, um, so we'll have a, in, in the best case scenario in the kind of system that, that Sab Lesser is going for, we're going to have a system in place that's going to ensure um, fair enough distribution. Um, and so those who don't have the relevant enhancement goods, it'll be because they chose not to in many cases. Okay. Okay, so we'll deal with this last one and then we'll go ahead and close. So the perfect child, sterility and loss of mystery, again, kind of cluster type objection. Um, so um, enhancement is trying to create the impossible, the perfect child, society will become boring and plain with everyone looking the same. This is like on a par with that homogenization concern that we've already anticipated. So some of these objections, they, they overlap in various ways. And people will lose the mystery of who their children will be and become, and that's obviously, or at least according to this objection, obviously um, something bad. Or at least we're missing out on something that's really, really good. Um, something about like, having mystery, right? In terms of what our children are gonna be like. Um, maybe there's something into that into, uh, involving the anticipation of how our children end up being. That's um, a great good to us in a certain way. So, um, that's the uh, objection challenge or the counter objection by Sabalescu. We, can, we can't produce a perfect child. So no one who's working in this area or at least almost no one working in this area would wanna claim that the aim of um, biotechnology is to make perfect children. The goal is to improve lives, improve, improve the lives of our children, improve our lives more generally. So people want children that look like they do. So um, and have traits that they have. So this should help ensure diversity or biodiversity. Um, and we won't lose out on mystery, at least not completely, because it's, in terms of in, enhancing our children, when we're selecting for various traits that they'd have, we're really just affecting um, um, or impacting the probabilities. We're not determining the probabilities because 
the genes are always going to express themselves in an environment. We don't have total control of the environment to, to then have total, to have total control over the genes in the first place. It's not as if they're, it's not as if by, by um, having total control of the environment, we want to have to, total control over the genetic expressions either. So um, there's still be plenty of mystery. And then lastly, um, there's some things that, um, there's some mysteries that we should be willing to give up, like whether or not our children are going to be healthy, born with you know, all their fingers and toes and organs um, intact and, and all the rest, right? Okay, so that'd be part of um, the response to this uh, third objection, the perfect child sterility and loss of mystery objection. But I should stop there because I think I've gone a minute over. Uh, anything I can say by way of clarification to conclude? All right, so I guess that's it for this time. Um, we'll conclude with this Savalescu piece and then segue to the moral enhancement um, issue next time. It'll be more Savalescu, but Savalescu can join with Ingmar uh, person. Hope you're well, hope you have a great night and um, I'll see you all then on Thursday. Be in touch if you have any questions. Take care.